Any form of group effort, where two or more people form a cooperative alliance for the purpose of accomplishing a definite purpose, becomes more powerful than mere individual effort. A football team may win consistently and continuously by well-coordinated teamwork, even though the members of the team may be unfriendly and out of harmony in many ways outside of their actual work on the ball ground. A group of men composing a board of directors may disagree with one another, they may be unfriendly and in no way in sympathy with one another, and still carry on a business which appears to be very successful. A man and his wife may live together, accumulate a fair-sized or even a great fortune, rear and educate a family, without the bond of harmony which is essential for the development of a mastermind. But all of these alliances might be made more powerful and effective if based upon a foundation of perfect harmony, thus permitting the development of a supplemental power known as the mastermind. Plain cooperative effort produces power. There can be no doubt about this. But cooperative effort that is based upon complete harmony of purpose develops superpower. Let every member of any cooperative group set his heart upon the achievement of the same definite end in a spirit of perfect harmony and the way has been paved for the development of a mastermind, providing all members of the group willingly subordinate their own personal interests for the attainment of the objective for which the group is aiming. The United States of America has become one of the most powerful nations on earth, largely because of the highly organized cooperative effort between the states. It will be helpful to remember that these United States were born as the result of one of the most powerful masterminds ever created. The members of this mastermind were the signers of the Declaration of Independence. The men who signed that document either consciously or unconsciously put into operation the power known as the mastermind, and that power was sufficient to enable them to defeat all the soldiers who were sent into the field against them. The men who fought to make the Declaration of Independence endure did not fight for money alone. They fought for a principle, the principle of freedom, which is the highest known motivating force. A great leader, whether in business, finance, industry, or statesmanship, is one who understands how to create a motivating objective which will be accepted with enthusiasm by every member of his group of followers. In politics, a live issue is everything. By live issue is meant some popular objective toward the attainment of which the majority of the voters can be rallied. These issues generally are broadcast in the form of snappy slogans, such as Keep Cool with Coolidge, which suggested to the minds of the voters that to keep Coolidge was the equivalent of keeping prosperity. It worked. During Lincoln's election campaign, the cry was, Stand back of Lincoln and preserve the Union. It worked. Woodrow Wilson's campaign managers, during his second campaign, coined the slogan, He kept us out of war. And it worked. The degree of power created by the cooperative effort of any group of people is measured always by the nature of the motive which the group is laboring to attain. This may be profitably borne in mind by all who organize group effort for any purpose whatsoever. Find a motive around which men may be induced to rally in a highly emotionalized, enthusiastic spirit of perfect harmony, and you have found the starting point for the creation of a mastermind. It is a well-known fact that men will work harder for the attainment of an ideal than they will for mere money. In searching for a motive as the basis for developing cooperative group effort, it will be profitable to bear this fact in mind. At the time of the writing of this lesson, there is much adverse agitation and general criticism directed against the railroads of the country. Who is back of this agitation, this author does not know, but he does know that the very fact that such agitation exists could and should be made the motivating force around which the railroad officials might rally the hundreds of thousands of railroad employees who earn their living by railroading, thereby creating a power that would effectively eliminate this adverse criticism. The railroads are the very backbone of the country. Tie up all railroad service and the people of the larger cities would starve before food could reach them. In this fact may be found a motive around which a large majority of the public could be caused to rally in support of any plan for self-protection which the railroad officials might wish to carry out. 
The power represented by all of the railroad employees and a majority of the public who patronize the railroads is sufficient to protect the railroads against all manner of adverse legislation and other attempts to depreciate their properties. But the power is only potential until it is organized and placed definitely back of a specific motive. Man is a queer animal. Give him a sufficiently vitalized motive and the man of but average ability under ordinary circumstances will suddenly develop superpower. What man can and will accomplish to please the woman of his choice, providing the woman knows how to stimulate him to action, has ever been a source of wonderment to students of the human mind. There are three major motivating forces to which man responds in practically all of his efforts. These are, one, the motive of self-preservation, two, the motive of sexual contact, three, the motive of financial and social power. Stated more briefly, the main motives which impel men to action are money, sex, and self-preservation. Leaders who are seeking a motivating force out of which to secure action from a following may find it under one or more of these three classifications. As you have observed, this lesson is very closely related to the introductory lesson and lesson two, which cover the law of the mastermind. It is possible for groups to function cooperatively without thereby creating a mastermind, as, for example, where people cooperate merely out of necessity without the spirit of harmony as the basis of their efforts. This sort of cooperation may produce considerable power, but nothing to compare with that which is possible when every person in an alliance subordinates his or her own individual interests and coordinates his or her efforts with those of all other members of the alliance in perfect harmony. The extent to which people may be induced to cooperate in harmony depends upon the motivating force which impels them to action. Perfect harmony, such as is essential for creating a mastermind, can be obtained only when the motivating force of a group is sufficient to cause each member of the group completely to forget his or her own personal interests and work for the good of the group or for the sake of attaining some idealistic, charitable, or philanthropic objective. The three major motivating forces of mankind have been here stated for the guidance of the leader who wishes to create plans for securing cooperation from followers who will throw themselves into the carrying out of his plans in a spirit of unselfish and perfect harmony. Men will not rally to the support of a leader in such a spirit of harmony unless the motive that impels them to do so is one that will induce them to lay aside all thoughts of themselves. We do well that which we love to do, and fortunate is the leader who has the good judgment to bear this fact in mind, and so lay his plans that all his followers are assigned parts that harmonize with this law. The leader who gets all there is to be had from his followers does so because he has set up in the mind of each a sufficiently strong motive to get each to subordinate his own interests and work in a perfect spirit of harmony with all other members of the group. Regardless of who you are, or what your definite chief aim may be, if you plan to attain the object of your chief aim through the cooperative efforts of others, you must set up in the minds of those whose cooperation you seek a motive strong enough to ensure their full, undivided, unselfish cooperation, for you will then be placing back of your plans the power of the law of the mastermind. Your position is nothing more than your opportunity to show what sort of ability you have. You will get out of it exactly what you put into it, no more and no less. A big position is but the sum total of numerous little positions well filled. You are now ready to take up Lesson 14, which will teach you how to make working capital out of all mistakes, errors, and failures which you have experienced, and also how to profit by the mistakes and failures of others. The president of one of the great railway systems of the United States said, after reading the next lesson, that this lesson carries a suggestion which, if heeded and understood, will enable any person to become a master in his chosen life work. For reasons which will be plain after you have read the next lesson, it is the author's favorite lesson of this course. Your Standing Army, and after the lesson visit with the author. Imagine an illustration which pictures a row of fifteen soldiers, all smart